Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. We'll be talking about a bunch of stories today. And the first of all, and off the bat, is the one that's been making headlines uh, for past many days now. The civilian protests that have resumed in Sudan in less than a month after a brutal crackdown on demonstrators by the Sudanese military that killed over 100, 100 people. Thousands have come out in what organizers are calling the Million Man March, demanding the end of military control in Sudan. Security forces fanned out across Khartoum and used bullets, tear gas, beatings against peaceful protesters to try and deter them. There were over 11 deaths and numerous injuries. The ruling military transition council blames the main opposition party here, which is the Freedom and Change Party, who in turn blames the rapid support forces, a militia led by warlord G Lieutenant General Mohammed Hamdan Digalo, also known as Hemti. Now, Lieutenant General Hamdan has emerged as a pivotal and controversial figure after former President Umar al-Bashir was deposed. But analysts say that the scale of violence this time around the June 30th protest could have been much greater. Was this deliberate restraint due to international pressure, not least from the United States, which has, of course, strong influence on its regional allies, who are, of course, been showing support to Hemthi and his other Factions. Now, was Hemthi surprised by the scale of demonstrations this time around? We will be finding out this and a lot more from our guests. Let me introduce first on the panel, we have Ms. Aya Ibrahim. She's an analyst. She's joining us from Berlin. And also we have Mr. Tom Rhodes, another journalist joining us from Nairobi. I want to start with you, Ms. Aya, if you had to just talk about the developments that have taken place since June 30th. In the past two days, would you say the scale that we're seeing on the streets of Khartoum and 21 other cities across Sudan, would you say this is a, a surprise turnout considering the internet blackout uh, that Sudan is seeing? Absolutely. It is, it is indeed a, a, a surprise uh, a turnout. Just to give uh, the viewers a little bit of background, um, the, 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 this brutality that you talk about on June 3rd, this happened on the main sit-in area in, in Khartoum. Uh, and this was a, essentially a traffic juncture that protesters had occupied since uh, April 11th, since, since they overthrew uh, Omar uh, al-Bashir. And they had refused to leave this, uh, this, this sit-in area um, uh, basically until their demand for a civilian government was to be met. The military council had said a number of times that uh, it was it was it was not tolerating so what it called the the chaos uh, of the sit-in i myself was in the sit-in area in in early may and uh, it was as far as i could tell an extremely peaceful organized uh, protest and then the crackdown on june 3rd came and uh, it was a surprise i'm in touch with a lot of protesters that are still on the ground it was a surprise sort of brutal attack many of them even called it a massacre with tents being burned reports of men and women being raped uh, in, in 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 the violence and since june 3rd really uh, the protest have been forced to go underground and have uh, not been able to communicate uh, with the outside world easily, but also not without each other. Uh, with each other, and um, it, the, the 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 march on June 30th was definitely a surprise because of the scale of it. It showed that the the protest movement still could uh, galvanize these masses uh, even uh, with an internet blackout, resorting to very traditional uh, methods such as printed leaflets. I've seen many of these, or even going door to door instead of using hashtags talking to each other mm -hmm. and for uh, what what is uh, called the sort of the neighborhood committees mm -hmm. uh, that are in the different neighborhoods uh, working together to make sure that these different marches then met and uh, and actually uh, for us to be able to see the images that we saw coming out of uh, Khartoum and other uh, towns around Sudan uh, is quite uh, quite uh, quite a, a, a huge comeback I would say for the protest movement and shows that uh, despite of the crackdown they still command the streets and they still are able uh, to, uh, to 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 gather that many people. And so far, there have been confirmed 11 deaths of the protesters on the hands of the military. Is there some kind of this coming in the way of as a form of deterrence to them? Is it demoralizing or are the numbers just growing strong despite of this? So basically, I mean, uh, the, the military council, uh, the, tr the military transitional council, the night before the planned protests came out and in a statement very clearly said, you know, we blame the, the, the freedom, uh, the, force of free the forces of freedom and change, which is a, essentially an umbrella group for many opposition parties for any loss of life that happens on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, the protesters, however, have uh, maintained that they are peaceful, that they are uh, unarmed. Uh, uh, but I, I, my sense from the people that I'm speaking to on the ground that uh, this is... Uh, 
not really uh, deterring them. In fact, I would say that uh, between uh, between June 3rd and, and, and June 30th, mm-hmm. I sensed more fear in the people that I spoke to uh, than I did uh, yesterday and today, because then it was a fear for losing the, the, the gains of what they call a revolution. And now that they were able to uh, go out in the street and see each other, I would say that there's more confidence and uh, the, the violence is, is somehow making them more angry, more bitter, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and more determined to, to, uh, to remain on the streets. Uh, with that being said, uh, the violence that we've seen in the past two days, of course, every loss of life is precious, has not been uh, on a massive scale as we've seen in June 3rd. And uh, certainly there are signs that, uh, that, that the transition military council is capable of much more violence. So it's something that we have to keep watching closely. And while this violence is definitely less than what we saw on June 3rd in Khartoum and other areas in Sudan, Mr. Tom, if I could get your take on this, do you think the TMC, uh, sorry, the MTC, the Military Transitional Council is being cautious this time round or there is international pressure on them to scale back on uh, the response to the protesters? No, I, I agree with my colleague in, in, in Berlin, really. I, I, I think, actually, that the TMs, the Transitional Military Council, uh, are intimidated. I mean, they weren't expecting the numbers, uh, like my colleague said, to come out on the June 30th, especially after the way they cracked down on them on, on the 3rd of June, mm-hmm. which, by the way, was the last day of Ramadan when they when they uh, made that attack. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that you know perhaps it's a U.S. influence. I I would actually argue that the U.S. has little influence in this case. It's uh, perhaps much more the African Union and the fact that they removed their uh, membership um, about a month ago, uh, which has sort of startled the TMC because they always relied on the AU in the past. I mean, Bashir was a was a good friend of the African Union, and now the tables have turned. But the question about the U.S. influence here does come in. It does bring into uh, the uh, sort of a lot of analysts are commenting on this, that continuously being silent in itself is partaking in what is happening in Sudan here when they clearly have a lot of influence in the region. They they do. Um, I think the the, the TMC also know, though, that, um, you know, that particularly President Trump and the executive office in in the States uh, are best friends and uh, you know, staunch, staunchly supporting them. Um, and I think you know, Burhan, the, the head of the TMC and Himeti, they know this and they can they can work around it. Um, of, of course, I mean, yes, it's still certainly a factor. And, and you know, to be fair to some of the the politicians in, in the states, particularly in uh, members of Congress, have been very vocal and, and very uh, uh, you know strongly worded messages. So perhaps it has an influence, but I, I still suspect that it's. It's more the local influence and more the regional influence, which has uh, intimidated the TMC this time. Also, how do you see the TMC itself being able to uh, stand against the protesters? And how long do you think they can hold out? Uh, Himeti himself actually controls uh, gold mines in western, Dar- uh, sorry, northern Darfur state. Um, so they're sitting literally on, on, a, on a pile of gold and, and can probably stay you know in their bungalows for as long as they want and, and this is you know the fear that we have is that the protesters with, with the economy going down with with things not being on the shelves anymore uh, hyperinflation my, my fear actually is, is that you know the, the the economic situation might you know sort of wane right. away the, the movement right. but it hasn't done so far Okay, so Aya, let's get your take on this. What do you think? Is C in a corner right now or is it in a position of strength? I think my colleague is absolutely uh, correct that the the economic situation might actually t- start taking its toll on uh, the Sudanese uh, the Sudanese population. Let's not forget that uh, the demonstrations that led to the overthrow of Omar al Bashir were actually initially caused in uh, because of uh, the price uh, of. Uh, uh, of bread. Um, however, I think that the the the, free, the, the, the opposition uh, forces are uh, doing some actually quite intelligent maneuvering in the way that they're using their power. So right after the events of June 3rd, there was a three-day general strike, and it was a very successful general strike that actually did bring uh, Sudan to its um, to 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 an absolute standstill. Uh, but then after three days, they voluntarily called it off mm-hmm. precisely because uh, they were worried about 
about the economic situation that people needed to go back to their jobs and to be able to get food, etc. So I think that they so far are, uh, you know, walking this very fine line quite uh, wisely to, uh, on the one hand, sh demonstrate their strength on the street and then mm -hmm. retreat uh, back, uh, demonstrate their strength and then retreat back. But absolutely, uh, the, the economic situation in in Sudan is is quite dire. Um, for, and it's really for, not in the favor of the reasons. protesters. Okay, but so, I think also what 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 is an important also looking at the TMC itself and its makeup. They themselves have said that they've thwarted a number of coup attempts internally within the transitional military council. So another question is also how much longer can the transitional military council actually also maintain its unity? As you've right. mentioned, Hemeti, the second man on the council, is now many say is the de facto leader of Sudan, but there are many other. Uh, mm -hmm. more junior officers that, per that perhaps might not be happy with the amount of influence that the RSF right. forces have in the country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ayah. That's a good point you've raised there, Mr. Tom. Let's address this internal conflict within the TMC also. Hemeti is looked down upon by the senior trained officials of the army as being someone who was just posted there by Umar al-Bashir, who was basically an, uh, is an illiterate cow herder, camel herder. I mean, he's not looked at favorably at all. So is there a possibility that disintegration within the TMC in the army could cause them to maybe not hold out as long as they they are expected to? It, there's a definite possibility. Um, I mean, and, and you've hit it on the head, really. You know, that he's considered, a, he's, he's ethnically a, a Rizia Gat. And, and, you know, culturally in Sudan, there's always been this sort of cultural divide between those in the riverine communities mm -hmm. um, close mm -hmm. to the Nile and those out in Darfur whom they consider less educated, etc. So, yeah, there is definitely a certain amount of animosity um, within the TMC. Mm -hmm. And and it's mm -hmm. interesting if you sort of look at the speeches uh, between the head, uh, the General Bahan and Himeti, um, they take a very different kind of a tone. Uh, Bahan is much more apologetic and, and uh, you know, sort of seems to be taking a softer tone while Himeti is taking a much harder Mm -hmm. uh, uh, caustic tone. So it's, there are also yeah. unconfirmed reports that have uh, surfaced in the past few weeks uh, that claim that hundreds of lower ranking officers from the regular army have been essentially posted uh, on far corners of the city or outside posts in Khartoum, outside of Khartoum, and or if their loyalties have been under suspicion, they've even been disarmed. Absolutely. I mean, look, there were some soldiers. Um, I wasn't in Khartoum uh, on the 3rd. I, I almost happened to be there. But, uh, you know, talking to some friends on the ground, they, they did tell me that some of the soldiers actually tried to help the protesters uh, on that terrible day on, on the June 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, particularly, like you say, on the lower ranks, the middle to lower ranks, there's a lot of animosity. And there has been a lot of animosity for a long time. And, and this is sort of why Himeti's come to power, because mm -hmm. Bashir favored the militia mm -hmm. over over the army, the national army. So there's not just the army that's facing some kind of a internal conflict. I mean, the SPA has been blamed and questioned for its loyalties also. What are the reasons that they are being questioned by opposite parties and uh, other protesters who are, uh, who are uh, civilians, essentially, from in Sudan? It's, it's, it's tough. I mean, I, mean I, you know, my sympathy goes out to the Freedom and Change Coalition because it's, it's a huge umbrella of different opposition groups and armed groups. And to, to reach consensus among them uh, is, is challenging. So some of the problems are that, you know, some of the armed groups, especially uh, those fighting in the Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile and okay. Darfur, uh -huh. feel as if they're not part of the uh -huh. process as much as they should be, the negotiation okay. process. Right. Okay. So here I want to welcome another guest who's just joining us. It's Dr. Sa Abdul Galil, an activist uh, from England, is also joining us here on Newswire. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sa. We're talking about essentially dissent within the ranks, whether it is the Transitional Military Council or it is within the opposition groups that have been out in tens and thousands on the latest protests in Sudan. What we're trying to understand here is that uh, in the allegations against the SPA, is there any kind of credibility that they could have done more to align themselves with the sympathizers in the army? Mm -hmm. uh, the Sudan Professional Association, together with other groups in the uh, uh, Forces of Freedom and 
and change um, have been always uh, promoting peaceful resistance and nonviolent movement. And uh, we have been, or our people have been practicing the right for freedom of assembly and speech, which part of it was the sitting in front of the uh, military headquarters. Mm-hmm. Actually, before this massacre, the security team for the um, FFC had a press conference mm-hmm. and they have raised concern that there was no, um, you know, good communication mm-hmm. despite all of the effort with the security team from the TMC. Now, I, I wouldn't at all accept that uh, the TMC who came uh, openly in a press conference and mm-hmm. said that we have ordered the crackdown of the sitting, mm-hmm. that uh, we can try to find another excuse about the responsibility to protect the people. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the TMC, the Transitional Military Council, claims that they came to protect the people and to hand over the power. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for the military and for the police. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the responsibility for the security lays within that body completely. And we have called for an independent investigation. Coming to your question. uh, Sorry to cut you there, but uh, since we're running out of time, I very quickly want to ask ask you this. That is it true then that the SBA could have put in a legal request for protection or uh, for before heading out for protests on June 3rd uh, the as we said we what we were practicing is a freedom of expression and assembly mm-hmm. and we have always asked that that should be continue and promoted that peacefully right there was w- let me put the question for you in another way uh Yeni. why should you crack a sit in a peaceful crackdown and kill hundreds of people what no, is absolutely. the justification no, th- to kill one person? Absolutely. There is absolutely no justification okay. for that. So but the question really is, that the protesters day. on the streets were really under a lot of threat already. They had been attacked, they had been abused, they had been treated unfairly and badly. There must have been some kind of warning that could have saved those 120 so lives that uh, were lost on that fateful day. For seven weeks, there has been security team looking after the sit-in, not a single uh, sort of uh, violent act from Mm -hmm. the protester. You have to remember as well that this revolution is led by the people of Sudan. And what they want, Mm -hmm. we are their voice, but they determine what they want. The question goes back to the TMC. Why would you crack a peaceful resistance and kill people? Okay. This is the question. Why have you not been engaged with the security team fully? Okay. Why have you been in Egypt came and killed the innocent people? This is the question. We need an international independent uh, uh, investigation with national experts that we can trust them. People okay, have then been then, killed okay, on the third Right. Now, I, I want to ask you this, though, Dr. Sara. Let's move on with the next question. What I want to ask you is the, the Ethiopian pr- proposal that was offered and the African Union proposal that was offered, both of them were initially rejected by the Transitional Military Council. Hypothetically, had they been accepted because the opposition parties and the civilians did accept them, do you think they would have worked out? Well, this is the, the at the moment one of the options that we have mm-hmm. uh, to achieve uh, the handover. Uh, the FFC have accepted that, but they have submitted some points that would uh, they would like to be reviewed mm-hmm. um, uh, about uh, the proposal. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not a surprise that the TMC have rejected that because since the April the 11th, they have been far trying to find different ways and means to delay the handover and to engage fully. Mm-hmm. Are they? committed that's the question okay. are they committed really for a handover peacefully unconditionally to a civilian led government that's the question nothing ha- so far mm-hmm. proves that they are committed is there any kind of uh, what do you call it like a neighborhood team sort who can protect them from any kind of onslaught from the military or is everybody unarmed and on the streets peacefully protesting so we are against, against any violent resistance we are. We only uh, promote non-violent, peaceful resistance. Mm-hmm. All of that, any allegation to accuse anybody of causing chaos, that's not true. Mm-hmm. For example, my colleague, who was a doctor, was participating in the protest when okay. they were crossing uh, the bridge between Khartoum and Omdurman peacefully. Mm-hmm. They were shot by fires. 
he was shocked that people were just walking with no stick and no stone. Mm -hmm. And they were fired and they had to run into the hospital. The hospital was invaded mm -hmm. and people were even shot inside the hospital. It is very clear for the last six months mm -hmm. that this is one of the, um, I would say, history will talk about this, about this nonviolent resistance. And mm -hmm. we reject any, any suggestion to pull us to uh, violence mm -hmm. and any false allegation about using violence. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sara, giving us a very clear insight of how the situation is unfolding there. Very quickly, Mr. Tom, I just want—I have one last question before we wrap up this segment, is essentially, can Hemeti be stopped here? Because if we talk about what the international community is doing, the UN resolutions, none of them have been passed. There's just been a lot of comments from the Western world and the UN itself. What do you think is going to be the way forward in trying to bring this to an end finally? Yeah, it, it's it's a tough, tough it's a tough situation, and and, and you know when, when you ask can Hameti be stopped, I, I honestly I don't know. I mean he has, you know, over forty thousand troops. He has, uh, as I said before, these gold mines, so he has a lot of resources at his fingertips, mm -hmm. uh, and he has a weakened uh, national army. So um, you know even if even if uh, the negotiations are made and they're actually they actually adhere to what the agreement between the AU and the Ethiopia uh, mm -hmm. had made. Mm -hmm. um, there's little to say that he'll necessarily stick to that agreement or, you know, um, sort of in the long term. It's um, nowhere in the Sudanese it. constitution, is it, that any kind of a transition to democracy would entail a military transitional council that would just stick around uh, for whatever time period they uh, declare? That's right. That's right. You know, and, and, and that's, you know, I guess that's the concern. And, and I'm sure my, my colleague in the SPA is, is very aware of that. Um, you know, but again, I, I still remain hopeful. I, I was so, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to sound callous, you know, despite the, the mortality figures and, and mm -hmm. let's not forget the injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, June 30th was a day of hope for many of us because people came out in such strong numbers, okay. despite the terrible okay. massacre um, earlier in the month. And I, I think this is, may have made an impact on, on the TMC and perhaps forced them to negotiate further. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Tom Rhodes and Dr. Sara, uh, for giving us your time here on Newswire, talking about the situation in Sudan as uh, the Sudanese struggle to get a set up government and transition into democracy. We will be taking a quick short break. When we're back, we'll be talking about what's happening in Libya and what's Turkey up to. Welcome back to Newswire. While we were talking about Sudan in the first half of the show, we're now moving on to Libya and what is happening there. Libya's renegade military commander leading the Libyan National Army, General Haftar, is currently pulling in, it seems, turns Turkey into a new row of tensions between the two. Now, since April this year, Haftar and his self-styled army, they've been fighting an armed campaign to seize the Libyan capital, Tripoli, from the UN-recognized government of national accord, which is led by Prime Minister Faisal Saraj. Now, Turkey has been supporting the GNA by providing them with trucks and drones. And as the Turkish President Erdogan recently admitted, has also sold weaponry and equipment to them. On Sunday, Turkey warned LNA to release six of its citizens or suffer the consequences. The Turks were released a day later. Now, before that, Haftar had blamed Turkey for backing the GNA in the latest offensive on retrieving Garyan from the LNA, after which he ordered his forces to target Turkish companies, ban flights, and arrest Turkish nationals. Now, Haftar's attack has seems that it's failed to achieve any of its objectives so far, with the eastern, his eastern-based forces struggling still to get hold of Tripoli. So, with this latest move of taking on Turkey, the question really is, what is Haftar hoping to achieve? Let's find out from our guests. With us today, we have Mr. Al-Zawawi, an analyst joining us from England, and also Mr. Jalal Hashawi, who is also an analyst joining us from The Hague. And we have Rear Admiral Dennis Kutluk, a lecturer at the Ankara University School of Law. Welcome to all three of you to Newswire. Mr. Bashir, if I can start with you, my question really is, what exactly Haftar is trying to achieve here? 
So at the beginning, we should realize that what Haftar is trying to do is to keep Turkey away from supporting the, G the GNA, which he is fighting in Tripoli now. So with the help of the Turkey, the GNA became more stronger and was able to stop the campaign of Haftar on the outskirts of Tripoli. So the main aim of Haftar here is to prevent Turkey from giving any support to the GNA. All right. Uh, Mr. Jalal, let me come to you also uh, with the same question. What in your take is Haftar's uh, goal here, trying to take on a country that has the second largest army in NATO? Uh, what is he thinking, hoping to uh, maybe distract or take them on? What is his uh, aim here? Yeah, I mean, you're on something when you talk about distraction or deflecting attention. There's something bizarre and uh, unusual about the uh, military con campaign conducted by Haftar uh, because, uh, you know, uh, he, he probably doesn't have, doesn't have a specific goal right now. If you look at just the Libyan component, what he has in mind is uh, somehow... Um, he has this goal of uh, being able to attract his foreign sponsors into helping him even more. And uh, to accomplish that, he's uh, uh, trying to show his presence in northwest Libya as something that is, of course, not at the finish line, but mm -hmm. close enough so that his usual protectors, you know, mm -hmm. Egypt, um, uh, France and Russia and all Jordan, they somehow step up because they feel that it's close enough so they would help him more. If you remove that foreign component, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden what you see is really an army that is really struggling on, uh, on a territory that is very far away from its true headquarters. So uh, suddenly the picture looks more um, grim and, and discouraging if, uh, okay. if, if Haftar is not able to attract his uh, sponsors into doing even more. Okay, so now that uh, President Erdogan has come out and said, yes, we've been selling re and ammunition to the GNA, besides providing drones and trucks also, what is the extent of Turkey's involvement here in the Libyan conflict? Yeah, the first thing is uh, to say about Turkey is that Turkey has been interfering in Libya since uh, the summer of 2011. Uh, and, for example, like during the period between 2014 and 2016, it really did provide weapons into uh, Misraka and Tripoli. But the other thing that one must recognize from mm -hmm. a historical perspective is that Turkey has been relatively quiet since 2017. Mm -hmm. And it really uh, ramped up its interference and involvement after uh, April of this year. Because the environment was deemed more friendly, there's uh, a fog of war, there's confusion. And what the Turks saw was that the Libyans, the local Libyans, I'm talking about the, the militias in Tripoli, in Zawiya, in, in, of course, importantly, in, in the Strata, they were already doing a very good job holding the fort and resisting. So the calculus was to say, why don't we invest in here into mm -hmm. being very local and do it seriously. We try to come through for our friends in Tripolitania because we see that we could make a difference. And that's exactly what happened uh, in terms of uh, psychological effects on the Haftar army, in terms okay. of tactical help, and also strategically speaking. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Jalal Hashawi, there talking to us. I want to come to you, Rear Admiral Dennis Kutluk. Let's talk about what our guest here, Mr. Jalal, just mentioned, that one of the attempts that Haftar could be making to uh, bring in Turkey or take on Turkey here is to try and get more out of his international supporters. Do you agree with that? I don't think that we can uh, reliably refer to anyone's intention here, that's up to them, what they intend. But Turkey has legitimate interest uh, in the broader Libyan people, among the Libyan people, and supports, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. GNA governments, as others recognize. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, if Turkey pledged some uh, military assistance to the GNA government, it's between two countries, uh, the, the provisions of that agreement will be met uh, with mutual consent. 
since the UN arm embargo also has such a caveat mm -hmm. for the recognized states could cooperate in the area of military as well, but under meeting certain conditions, of course. Uh, to what extent Turkey supports the military, by military, the mm -hmm. Libyan government? Right. I think around Turkish open sources, we don't have much information, and you should approach to presidential circles for it. Right now, the confrontation that is on between Turkey and Haftar is essentially that we will attack your places of interest, your uh, people here in Libya. And uh, Turkey, do you think, how will it respond if such an event were to take place, Mr. Dennis? Yes. If any Turkish interest or mm, personal are attacked in uh, Libyan soils, mm -hmm. of, of course, there will be repercussions back. Right. And Turkey has made uh, the two days before that they will they will hold uh, renegade as they're accountable for it, and they will okay. attack those targets. Uh, they, they will recognize it as a legitimate targets. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We are now joined by Sinan Ulgan. He's an analyst and also a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe in Brussels, where his research is uh, focusing on Turkish foreign policy, and you're right now in Istanbul. Thank you for joining us here. We're talking essentially about not only uh, what this confrontation between uh, Haftar and Turkey could mean, but also let's bring up here the arms embargo that Libya has been under since 2011. And here the, pre the, pres uh, the Turkish president has come out and said that we've been selling arms and air munitions to GNA. What do you make of that? Well, I think uh, this is really a, a consequence uh, of uh, the now very confrontational situation in Libya, mm -hmm. where uh, indeed uh, Turkey uh, has sided uh, with the uh, recognized government. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are also other countries who are now openly supporting uh, Haftar. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have been uh, very clearly also uh, supplying uh, weapons. And as a result, uh, Turkey also uh, feels compelled under those conditions mm -hmm. uh, to uh, support uh, logistically and militarily mm -hmm. uh, the uh, government uh, in Tripoli. Right. Uh, so that's, that's really the, you know, the, uh, where we are today. And also, this brings up the question, really, that when weapons that originated from a end user that bought them from the U.S. under a rule that says they will not be resaled forward to anybody else, they show up in uh, a previously held area by Haftar. What does this bring to the international spectrum here? Is the U.N. going to stand up and take notice of it? Is there any significant action going to take place? Well, uh, obviously, you know, this is uh, yet another uh, indication of uh, how uh, international rules uh, and the UN decisions uh, have not been fully enforced. Mm -hmm. So, uh, indeed, uh, for the credibility uh, of the UN system, uh, there needs to be a follow up uh, based on this finding uh, if uh, going forward. Uh, a more stringent enforcement uh, of the uh, UN rules uh, and the now, on Libya is to be enforced. So when you say it needs to be enforced, there's an understanding that these end user agreements, that there is some mechanism in place, or is there none, no effective mechanism to counter check whether the sales of arms could be uh, moved forward to other countries? Well, I mean, obviously, no. These, uh, these mechanisms are uh, obviously not sufficient uh, to ensure uh, that mm -hmm. sort of uh, stringent, stringent control uh, based on end-user agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the reason why uh, we uh, definitely need uh, a more uh, effective uh, UN overview of the situation if the arms embargo is to be fully enforced. Also, Mr. Sinan, if we were to reflect a little, we just talked about earlier in the show about what is happening in Sudan. And now we're talking about Libya. Do you see any commonalities in terms of the international actors who are taking sides in both these countries? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, that's also, you can uh, also extrapolate uh, and include Syria as well. 
what we see is that when the international system itself, uh, through uh, its global global governance mechanism, and here particularly the UN system, uh, mm -hmm. is not able uh, to uh, diffuse the tension and take the initiative uh, in uh, finding a compromise, uh, then uh, the, you do have a power vacuum uh, where regional actors take over. Uh, uh, try to influence the events on the ground by using their own proxies. That's exactly what happened in Syria and Sudan, and now we see that in Libya. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Bashir, let me bring you into this part of the conversation. Now, I understand that there are international proxies. Obviously, they've always been in this centuries-old uh, geopolitical situation. But right now, what exactly is the end game envisioned? Because if there's another thing common here, is that these places that we're talking about of major conflict, uh, which have the same allies and the same opponents, they also are a huge resource for oil and other natural resources. Is that something significant? I think so, but just let me just, uh, just uh, highlight a bit on the uh, previous question of the, what derives Turkey Mm -hmm. uh, to intervene or to or to be a strong part in Libya, mm -hmm. so it is the first thing we have to recognize that is Turkey the historical relationship of Turkey as the earlier colonial to Libya since the 18th century, and then the second thing is the geopolitical factor, where is the Turkey is a major player in the region of the Mediterranean, and within this. Maybe we can recall here what is the uh, Turkish defense minister in his last visit to Libya. Mm -hmm. He brought a map with him and showed it to the Libyan officials there. This map shows that is the Greece would uh, uh, violating the Libyan uh, uh, continental shelf. So this area is uh, a very huge area, which is uh, rich of uh, oil and gas, and is still uh, unexplored uh, largely. So this is the main reason, uh, the geopolitics of the uh, uh, area. And also is the, uh, which is uh, uh, Minister of Defense. Okay. Referring here to the, uh, uh, a new project, which is, I think it's in 2015, which links the Israeli gas to Europe via uh, Greece and uh, Italy and mm -hmm. uh, Cyprus. Right. So the uh, the last factor of the what drives the uh, Turkey in Libya is the economic uh, factor, which is uh, is very uh, huge and large uh, for Turkey. Turkey has signed uh, contracts worth of 100 billion before the uh, Gaddafi was uh, ousted in Libya. So mm -hmm. between 2004 and 2009, uh, the contractors of Turkish uh, projects in Libya, also Libyan Turkish projects, mainly in construction, is worth of 100 billion. And the last and, thing uh, that uh, Turkey would want is to lose those contracts to a conflict that is clearly spiraling out of control. Hold that thought, though, Mr. Dennis. I want to get you in on also and talk about uh, not just why the international actors are taking such an interest, but at the same time, the silence we see across the board here. Now, Libya is a kind of a country that doesn't have any lack of funding because of its oil-rich capacity. Do you see the international community, their lack of taking a strong stand, maybe be the reason behind this imploding? There, there, are, there are many actors on the ground fighting with each other. If you were a, a, one of the international uh, states to take decision to involve into, you will, you will this idea immediately because you cannot guarantee the success, but you will, you will make sure that there will be casualties behind. So it's, it's hard to explain to your own constituencies that such and such turmoil in, on the ground in a power struggle, mm -hmm. you cannot make easily wins. Therefore, it's not easy to justify to take a decision for a government to get involved in such kind of, uh, let's say, combat zones uh, on the soil to take control. Even for the United States, it's true. If you look at the last statement made by Mr. Obama mm -hmm. before he, he uh, gives up the tenure to, to Mr. Trump, mm -hmm. they, they also uh, take a position that the, this is quite dangerous area. They don't know who is going to win. But of course, there's that oil-rich region. Mm -hmm. They 
all like to get control on the ground, but it will it will up to the uh, Libyan citizens to take final decisions, to take majority views, right. and to give the rights to minority and to to set stability in which then you can exploit resources there. Okay, it, thank it's you. It's difficult at this moment for any country. Right. It's difficult for any country. Thank you so much, Mr. Dennis, for giving us your opinion there. But coming back to you, Mr. Bashir, also talking about not just the international community silence or also the interest that they're showing here. What is it that the Libyan people want here between uh, a, uh, the GNA and then uh, against those who, uh, like Haftar, are saying they're fighting against corruption? Uh, so, in fact, in fact, the Libyan society is uh, divided. You have us, we, we see in the eastern part of the country, there is a major support of uh, Haftar and his militias to concur Tripoli and they provide uh, personnel to Haftar to achieve his goal. But in the western part of the country, we cannot see that much support for Haftar. But indeed, the, uh, the uh, great support in the eastern part of the country is attributed to the uh, tribal element which is have been providing Haftar with uh, many valuable resources in the east of the country. Bashir al-Zawawi, the analyst joining us from England, talking about Libya, Haftar, and how, once again, the international community seems to not be playing its role, whether it's the UN or it's uh, any other diplomat from the arena. We talked about Sudan earlier. And just before we wrap up the show, I want to highlight something that also took place on one of the biggest summits of the year, the G20, where President, President Trump's daughter, Ivanka Trump, showed up trying to make conversation. It almost seems like trying to make friends with some of the top world leaders. Let's see what she had to say. Yes, but there's lots of social justice. And if it's awesome, yeah. It, it, as soon as you start talking about the economic aspect of it, though, yeah. a lot of people start listening who yeah. wouldn't otherwise listen. listen. And the same with the defence side of it, yeah. um, in terms of the whole sort of business. It's been very male-dominant. Something in terms of something, something. And then you can see the expressions on everyone's face there. You can see the IMF chief woman, Christine Lagarde, giving her a very strange look as if to say, what on earth is she talking about? You also see the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau there. You see the French President Emmanuel Macron, British Prime Minister Theresa May, probably all thinking the same thing that other than winning the genetic lottery, what on earth is Ivanka Trump doing? And now Ivanka is also facing a lot of criticism, not just from people around the world, but especially the Democrats are having a field Twitter. She's, there are different memes that are coming up where basically you can see her placed not just in strange, uh, awkward situations, but in historical pictures as well. Because another place where she showed up on a G20 or was her presence in the class photo of the world leader standing right next to her father really does bring into question that what was President Trump thinking bringing his daughter, who clearly doesn't have as much experience as needed for such forums. And with that, we've come to the end of the show. We will see you tomorrow. Till then, goodbye.